Dunes, scorching sun, hot sand. No, not the Antarctic. A long train is rushing at great speed. The railway crosses the entire desert. It looks like a scene from a post-apocalyptic movie, but this is a real road. The Gulf Cooperation Council is a composition of several of the richest countries in the Middle East. They have teamed up to create a railway about 1,200 miles long to connect all the countries in this region. The most important part of the project is a 750-mile road for freight and passenger trains. The section runs from the Gulf of Oman to the Persian Gulf through the United Arab Emirates. The cost of this railroad is about $11 billion, while the entire project cost about $100 to $250 billion. The train rushing through the desert can help both the economic development of the region and the environment. By the middle of 2021, more than 30 million tons of granular sulfur were transported via the road. If they transported this amount by trucks, then carbon dioxide emissions into the air would be more than 80% higher. But the coolest thing is how this road is being built. In theory, it's much easier to lay a railway through the desert. If you build it in another place, you will encounter many difficulties. For example, there's a river or a lake in the path of the road under construction. In this case, you need to build a bridge or shift the riverbed. Also, the road can pass through forests, swamps, or jungles. A lot of money should be spent on clearing the path. And what if a railway faces a mountain? A lot of explosive and landworks can solve the problem. The train will pass through the resulting tunnel. But you risk breaking the stability of the entire mountain range. A huge rock can fall and block the tunnel. Clearing the path involves a lot of problems. But if you're in the desert, then all this can be avoided. There are no forests, rivers, and lakes. There is, in fact, a huge flat area. But there is a lot of sand here, and that's a huge problem. An ordinary grain of sand is mainly composed of quartz. By its properties, it's similar to sandpaper. It can scratch metal parts, deform the wheels and internal mechanisms of the train. The wind picks up billions of tiny grains of sand that can penetrate anywhere. The sand gets inside the train and slowly destroys it. They have to repair the train frequently and spend more money to keep it running. Sand wears out both the wheels and rails. This is not the first railway in a desert, though. The engineers of other roads turn the dunes into clay to solve the sand problem. The sand hardens and turns into a solid piece on the required section of the road. Also, the builders created walls of vegetation. They planted trees along the railroad. Leaves and branches block the sand and prevent it from getting inside the train. This time, to solve the sand problem, engineers have created a unique sand filtration system. Another big issue during construction is the heat. During the day, the temperature may rise to 118 degrees Fahrenheit. If you put an egg on the sand in this heat, it will quickly fry. During construction, people work with heavy metal and stone parts, use welding and electric saws. All this generates additional heat. So, a large part of the work took place at night. But it wasn't cool either. At night, the temperature drops to only 86 degrees Fahrenheit. The main part of the project includes not only railways. A regular four-lane road will also pass through the desert. According to estimates, about 8 million passengers per year will use the railway by 2050. Now, let's move to the U.S. Imagine a capsule-like train traveling at a speed of 760 miles per hour inside a vacuum tube. You and 20 other passengers get inside the capsule. The interior resembles a spaceship. You sit in a chair in a reclining position and fasten your seat belts. You can't stand up to your full height and leave your seat. However, you will arrive at your destination faster than you would want to use the bathroom. All the passengers are seated. The capsule doors are closing. 5, 4, 
3, 2, 1, start! Right now, you're accelerating to a speed that exceeds that of sound. You're hurtling faster than a bullet. If you watch this train from inside, it will pass by you faster than you blink. Fortunately, inside the capsule, you don't feel this speed. You only experience slight pressure, similar to when you take off on an airplane. Currently, there are no such trains in the world, but this technology is under development. It's called Hyperloop. Hyperloop trains can operate thanks to the aerodynamic cushion and powerful operation of vacuum pumps. Imagine you're playing air hockey. The puck is easily flying through the game area. This works thanks to small holes placed all around the field. They create a thin layer of air on the surface. The puck doesn't even touch the field itself, it levitates. There's no friction force. Hyperloop will work in a similar way. Air jets are located not on the pipe, but in the capsule itself. Thus, a tiny distance appears between the walls of the capsule and the pipe. And with the help of an electric motor, the train will be able to move. The friction force problem solved. The next issue is the air resistance. No big object can move at a high speed if the air is too dense. That is, you literally crash through the air and limit your speed. For example, aircraft fly at an altitude where the air density is much lower than on the ground. That's why the Hyperloop moves inside the pipe. Special pumps are placed on certain sections of this route and pump the air out. But not completely, since this requires a lot of energy consumption. Also, there's the idea of installing a special fan on the nose of the capsule. It will move all the incoming air under the capsule, improving the air cushion. The movement of a vacuum train is somewhat similar to the work of pneumatic mail. You probably saw it in the movies. Transparent pipes passing through the entire building. Parcels and letters move through those pipes at high speed. This vacuum train will have solar panels on the roof of the pipe to recharge the entire system. At first glance, the idea seems simple and ingenious. But at the beginning of the development, a small issue arose. The air cushion must always maintain a very precise distance between the tube and the capsule. But it's not easy to do this at a long distance. Any crack, bump, or rock in the pipe can lead to the crash of the entire structure. A minor earthquake can cause a catastrophe. The problem can be solved with magnetic levitation. Take two magnets from the fridge and try to press them together. Do you feel the resistance? According to this principle, maglev trains run on a magnetic cushion in many cities. However, to hold heavy cars with the amount of magnetic force, you need to charge your magnets with a huge amount of energy. They also need to be cool. This requires a lot of money, so maglevs aren't that popular in the world. Now we're going to Cambodia. A train that passes here is slow and doesn't have modern technologies. It's worth riding it only for adventure. Welcome to the Nori train. People make a broad deck out of bamboo and put it on a square frame with wheels. On such a handmade train, you pass through the jungles of Cambodia along the old highway. Such a journey is like a trip on trolleys in mining tunnels. The coolest thing is that you can build a little train car of your own. Just use the motor from a motorcycle or a boat. You can also accelerate using the oars. Locals can create such cars in four days. At about 30 miles per hour, you get to the next station. After the jungle and scorching sun, let's take some respite in snowy Switzerland. You get on the Glacier Express. It goes along one of the most beautiful railway routes in the world. There are wagons with panoramic windows, and what you see through them is a real winter fairy tale. White meadows, hills, snow-covered villages, and frozen lakes. Better brace yourself! High-speed and ordinary trains have no seatbelts for several reasons. First off, people simply won't use it, and no one will monitor this. There are belts on planes to keep us safe during turbulence. Cars have them to save us in case of emergency braking, or worse. People buy train tickets to get somewhere comfortably. 
They can get up, visit the restaurant, switch places. No one would appreciate the restrictive belts. There's another, more practical reason – security. The issue of seat belts on the train has been considered for many years. All experts agree that belts aren't necessary. Imagine a train filled with crash test dummies. See, that's me over there. Now, some of them are in their seats fixed with seat belts. Other mannequins are standing or walking around the cabin. And the train crashes. Unfastened dummies are flying up and hitting sitting passengers. This increases the number of injuries. Now picture two high-speed trains were going to derail. One of them with dummies in their seatbelts fastened, and another one with dummies sitting free. In the first train, the dummies get much more damage from the belts. And this is because the main danger in a train accident is the invasion of foreign objects into the cabin. The train falls on its side. At this moment, a log or a piece of iron gets inside through the window and pushes a dummy away. But if the dummy is fixed to the seat, the log flying in through the window will simply crush it. Motorcycles, cars, huge trucks, and even airplanes – they all have rubber tires. But trains have iron wheels, and the main reason here is the railway. A freight or passenger train is a long, unwieldy machine. It wouldn't be able to use a regular road because there are too many twists and turns on the way. That's why the train needs a guide path. It's faster and more practical. An ordinary road can be built like a railway without sharp turns, but in this case, it's much more profitable to turn it into iron. Railway tracks are more reliable than ordinary asphalt. They are much easier to build, and they don't wear out. Engineers created metal wheels to make the train move comfortably and safely. Steel wheels are much stronger. On a steel coating, ordinary rubber tires would quickly fail. And most importantly, there is much less friction force between steel wheels and railway tracks. This allows you to transport heavy loads with the least energy consumption. The wheels and rails have a conical shape that guides the train along the curvature. The cone shape at the top of the rails is inserted into the wheels. Thanks to this shape, trains enter turns without derailment. Between 2001 and 2010, the New York City authorities didn't get rid of the old trains. They cleaned about 2,500 cars from junk. Then they loaded those trains onto ships and took them to the coasts of several states. In the end, the train cars were lowered into the seabed. There, the trains became home to hundreds of thousands of fish and other sea creatures. Now, these cars have turned into artificial reefs. Shells, corals, sea sponges, perch, mackerel, and other fish inhabit them. Many divers and marine photographers watch as sea turtles and even dolphins swimming among the trains. This way, the people not only provided a new home for fish, but also saved about $30 million on disposal of trains. Almost any transport can go up or down along a road. To make a train pass any hill, they need to build a tunnel inside a mountain or even destroy it. Trains can't go uphill because of the small friction force between smooth steel wheels and the railway tracks. The grip of the rubber tire and asphalt is stronger and more tenacious. But the train is heavy, and its wheels cover a small area of the rail. There's also a strong grip, thanks to which the train can develop incredible speed. But as soon as the train goes up the hill, the distribution of its weight immediately changes, the friction force weakens, and the wheels begin to spin idling. There is a risky way to drive the train up. You increase the mass of the train, accelerate it in a straight line. This acceleration force may be enough to drive up a small hill. There is another, safer way. It's to supply the rails and wheels with teeth. Ow! Then the train will lock onto the road like gears. One of the coolest and most beautiful rack railway routes in the world is in Switzerland. The train passes through green fields, high mountains, and blue lakes. Ghost trains are real, and you can ride them. We're in England, at the railway station in the small town of Snaith. There are no parking lots or ticket offices. The station looks abandoned. But a train arrives here. 
You step inside the train car and notice that you're the only passenger of the ghost train. However, there's no magic here. A few empty trains run around the United Kingdom. They pass through abandoned railway stations. Authorities drive these trains because it's economically beneficial for the country. To cancel the ghost train route, they would need to go through a lot of bureaucratic procedures and spend taxpayers' money. So the trains travel all over the country and don't bother anyone. There's a unique railway complex in Stockholm, Sweden. About a quarter of a million people pass through Stockholm Central Station every day. Each person releases heat. This heat is collected by heat exchangers in the central station's ventilation system. Then, this energy is converted into hot water. After that, the water is pumped into the heating system of the buildings around the city. This is an eco-friendly way of extracting energy that helps reduce energy costs by 25%. And that's not just a bunch of hot air. Japan has some of the most punctual trains in the world. They arrive at stations to the minute. And if the train was late for some reason, station staff can get you a special key delay certificate, which you can present at work as a valid reason for being late. Train conductors, drivers, and station staff use a special pointing and calling system of physical gestures and vocal calls to avoid any errors. The passengers are super disciplined as well, which helps speed up the boarding process at each station. Japan also has the fastest train in the world. Maglev develops a speed of 374 miles per hour. This is almost one and a half times faster than a Formula One racing car. Unlike other trains, it has no wheels. This train uses a magnetic cushion. It's necessary to charge this magnet with huge energy to hold heavy wagons by magnetic force. Then it also needs to be cool. This requires a lot of costs, so maglevs are not very popular in the world. 